Okay, and share screen now. Okay, today's topic is about ushering a new season. Um, we will explain further in more details why we mean that it's a new season because um, there is a change of the, the type uh, that we felt and we have been warning our uh, clients as well as during Unicorn Investment Seminar or conference rather around November this year, we have already sent out a warning signal to most of the clients and hopefully people catch that signal uh, that a new type is arriving and later on we'll have more proof about what's happening right now so that can help you to have a better understanding of the market situation. Um, just a disclaimer, um, what I'm sharing is an overview of the market. Um, if there are some details with regards, especially with regards to your own personal real estate, your own personal assets, I think we should go into more details uh, subsequently. Uh, in other words, we should have a one-to-one -one or you can meet your consultant to have a, a more in-depth discussion because what we're sharing is really something of a more overview. Uh, it may affect us in certain locations, but it may not affect your particular location as significantly. So let's have an overview about the whole picture of this market. And then this is just a small disclaimer. So a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Adrian. Uh, I'm the key executive officer with Pegasus Property Solutions. Uh, we are a boutique real estate uh, brokerage firm. We are able to transact in sales, purchase, rental. Um, right recently, we also get got involved more into corporate tenancy, uh, tenancy management as well. Um, Thirteen years in real estate has brought me quite a series of uh, experiences, um, very exciting experiences along the way, which I'm more than willing to share with all of you. Uh, some of the lessons learned along the way as well with regards to real estate. And also some of the, oops, just one minute. I've got some clients uh, yeah, in the waiting room, sorry. Okay. Uh, so some of the clients that I used to be um, managing are from IKEA, Thibodin. These are all MNCs. IKEA, as you know, the furniture store. Thibodin is a construction company from the Czech Republic. DSM is actually a uh, nutritional company. U.S. Navy supplies, I was helping some of the uh, soldiers, in, especially in the Sambawang site at that time for relocation needs. Uh, and UWSC Southeast Asia, mainly in the campus in Dover. So it's helping them for relocation as well. So why is it important to start off with some uh, tenancy management? Because uh, if you're buying real estate or if you're a real estate investor, I felt that it's quite important for you to know what is in the mind of your customer and your customer are the tenants. So having this little experience, sometimes it helps me throughout the years to be able to understand from a customer perspective or tenant's perspective what they are looking for. So that when you invest or when you buy, be it a new launch or resale property or even a HDB property, there are some attributes that some of these tenants look out for, which as an investor, it may be good for you, but may not be good for the tenants. So some attributes that they look for, uh, which will make it much more rentable, uh, tenantable, so that you won't wait such a long time before you find a tenant or you won't lose your rental appeal. So these are some very important things and how I can add value to all our friends here in this webinar group. Um, also founded a building management company. Uh, we are now very privileged to be managing around 18 buildings in Singapore. Uh, some of the larger ones I think uh, we would know are like Laguna Park, uh, Stars of Colburn, Laguna Green, uh, Sunet. Some of these are around Newton. I think we have Sunet Tangling Park, we have Amaryllis Bill, uh, some of these larger condos and uh, helping with the MCSTs as a managing agent or MAs uh, is a privilege as well because uh, we get to know the maintenance uh, uh, impact of uh, build, uh, in the built environment, especially when we are more able to appreciate the impact of how a managing agency manages a condo and how it can preserve the value of a condominium. And sometimes we get certain information uh, that um, we, a normal agent may not be able to process and things like, you know, we know the health of the sinking fund in certain condominiums in Singapore, uh, which will actually help us to know whether there is a need in future for a top up on, on your sinking fund or upgrading of that, so and so forth. And of course, sometimes even managing landlords and tenants matters like uh, roof leakages and things like that, water seepages into your building. We are more able to advise our clients um, Generally, you know, whose responsibility it is. Is it the neighbors upstairs? Is it the uh, MCSTs that's responsible to pay for the bill for rectification? So these are some of the areas that we can add value. And these are some of the experiences I have over the past, um, I think, coming 14 years now. 
Okay, without further ado, let me start with the same chart that I always present to most of you. And why do I keep repeating this chart and this chart and this chart on the price movement is that we start with HDB first before we move to the private. It's because this is a very important piece of diagram, a very important piece of chart. And for any real estate salesperson or any real estate representative or any agent or friend that you have that is talking about real estate, and if they're unable to tell you when was the last pick and when was the last bottom? These are very important information because you need to know when, you, because property or property moves in cycle. And if you are unable to identify these years, like in HDB per se, the year is 2013. If the agent or a real estate practitioner is unable to tell you something like that, I think you need to think twice about engaging this person because he doesn't know that a lot of people that bought their HDB in the year 2013 until today, not all of them have actually broke even in their price. But one of the keywords I will be speaking very much frequently today as I go forward is break even, break even, break even. Because we want to know when most people break even. And the year 2013, anyone who have bought your house around the year 2013 will know that this critical year, this critical year for those who bought at the peak of the curve, very few of them have actually broke even until now. Maybe they have waited 10 years until today, where we are somewhere around here, uh, then we start to see that, oh, we finally have a, a luxury to be able to sell it at a profit or a small profit. But is it really profit? Again, later we'll have a case study to go through it to see whether if you have bought something at around 500,000 HDB, and if you have sold it at maybe 520 or 530,000, did you really make any money? Did you really enjoy a 30,000 or 20 or 30,000 dollars profit? We'll go through it later. But in this cycle, what we saw is a peak in 2013, the bottom in 2020. And right now, prices are still continuing to grow. So looking at the price movement, uh, we will be able to see that HDB prices continue to accelerate. We are still moving at 12 o'clock. We are still moving forward for HDB, but at a slower pace. Looking at quarter one, two, three, four in 2022, you can see that we are moving at ooh, almost close to above 2.5%, right, every quarter. That's why we hit the 10% in the year 2022. And the year before, during just right after COVID, it was much faster. And we all know that this was due to the bottleneck in the supply uh, in the supply of HDB flats, but this has much more been cleared slowly with more and more BTO flats being built. So now in 2023, uh, we have seen that the last quarter, uh, prices grew at a much more reasonable pace right now, 1%, 1.2%. So for the rest of the year, we do expect HDB prices to hover around 3 to 4% for the whole year. This is something that is healthy back to the 2020 level. Maybe not as uh, weak as 2018 or 2019, but certainly in a healthy position, just in line with inflation. So 2021 and 2022 are very much bull years. Uh, congratulations to those who are able to cash out. Uh, but let's, let's see what's going to happen in future uh, as we study along some of the HDB policies. So we all know HDB policies have changed. And from quarter two, two, zero, two, four, uh, no longer will we be talking about mature estate and immature estate. But there'll be new terms, new terminology that was introduced by our prime minister during the last National Day rally. And so the new terms we're going to be familiar is what is standard, what is plus, and what is prime. So in a brief, standard is basically everything island-wide. Plus, usually you look at projects that are near MRT. So if you talk about uh, Topayo, you'll be talking about those maybe around Topayo Central area. All right. Uh, or in, uh, in Tampines, you'll be talking about those close to the central area, near, near to the Tampines station. Those will be considered plus. Okay, these new terms may not apply to the existing resale flats, but these are the new BTO flats that will come out. They'll be classified under these terms. And Prime will be those best locations like, you know, Pinnacle and Duxton or those in... Uh, uh, just right smack in the center, maybe in, in Galang, in Beach Road, or, or those, those locations. Those will be considered prime locations. So these are terms that we'll get used to from next year, after around June onwards, uh, or rather second quarter, maybe around April, May, June onwards, they will be starting to announce all these HDBO, uh, HDB flats under this new scheme. So what are the subsidies for standard? You have the common subsidies that we have right now. For plus and prime, there will be more subsidies and the reason why there's more subsidies is because there'll be some subsidy recovery, as you see here later on, 
uh, with regards to plus and prime flat. So what you take now, you probably got to pay back a lot more in future, right? Um, critical thing to take note here is the MOP period or the minimum occupation period for standard plus and prime. So in standard, which is what we have right now, same scheme, you only need to wait five years. But for plus and prime flats now, you need to wait 10 years. That's quite a long time. So including your construction, which takes around three to four years, that could mean that you will, from the moment you commit to a flat to the moment you are able to sell, it's probably going to take you about 14 years. And if you're buying as a couple, unless you are buying under the owner and occupier uh, strategy, otherwise, if we both are joint owners, uh, it's likely that only after 14 years later, then will you be able to buy a, a condominium or private residential, right? And, and what it means is that, so if you're 30 years right now, you got to wait until 44 years and above before you can buy your uh, your private residential. So that's quite a long time for MOP, right? So something to take note for those who are interested in plus and prime properties. A wait out period is more for private residential owners. So private residential owners, if I want to buy a, a downgrade, a downsize or right size right now, if I want to buy into a, uh, basically I have a 15 months wait out period anyway, but for plus and prime, you have a 30 months wait out period. In other words, only after 30 months, then I can buy a plus or prime flat. That's about two and a half years later. So again, this restricts the group. So if you are somebody who will just enjoy on block, uh, or well from on block properties, so yeah, I got an on block in a condo or something, I like got wait 30 months later, before I can enter the HDB, or rather 15 months if I can buy a, a HDB, but 30 months if I want to buy a, buy a plus and prime flex. For standard flex, is 15 months, right? Subsidy recover, which I've mentioned. Rent out, this is something very critical because if you are thinking of rental income in future, uh, basically, if you now uh, buy a normal HDB flex under the standard scheme, you will be able to rent out uh, your whole unit after MOP, after five years. Meanwhile, you can still rent out your room. For plus, all right, those that are under the plus scheme, you can only rent out your rooms. Plus and prime, basically. You can only rent out your rooms. You cannot rent out the whole unit. So for those who are looking to maximize your rental yield or passive income, I think the government with this new policy has blocked out rental flats generally like for whole units in the CBD area from the future. So this would mean that those currently uh, in flats like Pinnacle, like Duxton, and those that are in prime location, uh, those that do not fall under this scheme right now, uh, it generally means that there's a huge opportunity. And this is what we saw. Okay, before that, uh, this is what we saw right now in the marketplace because uh, there is a spurt in the demand for those good locations right now because that they know for any condo downgraders or people that are moving down from condos generally in future, these are the areas that they can focus upon. Okay, what is the $14,000 income ceiling uh, for PLUS and why is it so important? Okay, when there is an income ceiling, that means there's a, also a cap on the resale price. And this $14,000 income ceiling basically tells you that there's a cap for the income uh, for the resale price. And what this Based on the MSR, this price cap is now at 1.06 million. Meaning you have a if you buy a plus flat in future, it is unlikely if, if the if the income ceiling remains the same, it's unlikely that your price can go above 1.06 million based on this current income ceiling. So even if I'm a H, uh, even if I'm a condo owner and I have uh, I can fully pay without having to take any loan. But I also will fall under this income ceiling. Usually, if you can fully pay a 1.06 million, most of us will have exceeded the $14,000 income ceiling. So this price cap is important because that limits the growth of your capital and the asset growth of your, or rather the capital appreciation for your HDB flat in plus and prime locations. Something for us to take note of uh, when we buy plus and prime. So what causes this is that, um, we see a surge recently in the number, especially after the National Day Rally, in that announcement from the National Day Rally, we see a record number of million dollar flats being transacted right now in prime locations. People are rushing in to buy places in Pinocchio, in Duxton, in Topayo, uh, around Tiong Bahru and all these locations. And it continue to progress and continue to rise because they do not fall under this scheme. So these current HDB flats do not, that do not fall under this scheme in very, very prestige or good locations I think they will enjoy a surge in uh, a, a, a surge in their demand, a sudden surge in their demand, and of course the prices will continue to accelerate 
based on these recent policy shifts and changes. So every time we have a policy of change, uh, shifts or changes, while well, it curbs the lottery effect in future, but it actually benefits those who are already sitting on the lottery ticket. So those who are currently having and owning a flat in this location, congratulations, because I think you continue to hold on to an asset that is going to appreciate. So you might see maybe like Pinnacle and Duxton at one time, or maybe in future one day, it will be so. We are already at 1.5, maybe close to $2 million in future. So Pinnacle and Duxton could go there. But you'll see your neighbors, those under the prime scheme, still stuck at 1.06 million uh, because of the income ceiling. So certain certain areas will be will be having this kind of impact. So uh, if you're thinking of upgrading, if you're thinking of moving, I think you can consider it despite the prices being quite high right now, I would think in the prime locations, I think there's a future potential growth and such in the demand for, for new uh, the resale flats that do not fall under the prime and plus uh, scheme. My focus for HDB market, uh, the HDB is on track right now, certainly on track to build the 23,000 BPO flats in 2023. And we'll see more releases of new uh, HDB flats next year as well. Um, we have launched, uh, just to give you an overview, every year we see, before COVID, we are seeing around 14,000 flats that's being launched in the BTO market. Last year, they beat up and built up supply to 17,000. This year, 23,000. The stockpile has been increasing and increasing. And the time taken for construction is now getting shorter and shorter post-COVID. During COVID, we saw that supply bottleneck, but these have slowly eased. The construction sector has since stabilized and, and we are now seeing more and more flats, uh, more and more applicants. In fact, we are seeing more and more uh, applicants rejecting the HDB flats uh, that they BTO for, uh, mainly because they have more choices today. So this is the uh, impact that we are seeing right now. And because of this, uh, that HDB flats is, as, as mentioned earlier, HDB flats in prime location are seeing a very huge demand, mainly due to the recent policy changes. Um, the market has also moderated. Uh, we have seen earlier in the quarterly chart, we saw that we have moved from 2%, 2.5% to right now about 1% to 1.5% quarterly growth. That is healthy in line with inflation. Uh, rent, rental market has also moderated uh, from the previous months. So right now, if you are a tenant and you're looking to, to rent a whole unit, uh, the good news is it's not as bullish as it seems. Uh, and maybe some landlords may still be demanding very high rents. But realistically, they will be stuck if they consist, continue to persist on expecting a very high bullish rent because the rental market has definitely moderated. And being in the market myself, sometimes I do transact in sales and, and rental. Uh, I have to be there because I can actually feel the temperature uh, of, of the inquiries, the number of inquiries that come in. And generally, I can say that, yes, the rental market has definitely moderated. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the sale market is likely to grow by 3 to 4% in 2023. So this is about the HDB markets. If you have any questions with regard to HDB market, please post in the chat group. Um, I'm going to go on to the private residential market in a very short while. Just let me see if there's any other questions on HDB. Uh, yeah, let me see just one from Chang. Yeah, reason for prime price for potential cap. Is it due to income ceiling? Yes, because uh, how I get this 1.06 million, you basically take the $14,000 income ceiling. Uh, HDB loan is subject to what we call uh, MSR or mortgage servicing ratio. So that's the maximum that a person can borrow. So based on the mortgage servicing ratio, the maximum price, the maximum transaction price is 1.06 million. So that's how I got 1.06 million. So that's for someone who is willing to borrow. So borrow up to the maximum of 80% loan, right? Borrowing up to maximum of 80%. Okay. So let me go back to my slides. Right. Let me move on to the private market. Again, as I mentioned earlier about HDB, and if you're engaged with a salesperson or real estate agent that do not know anything about the cycle in the private market, then I think you got to be a bit more wary because this is like our Bible, our scripture, something that, and, and it's been very effective for me because every time I do a presentation to a, uh, to a, to a local uh, purchaser or to a foreigner, I use this to illustrate 
the momentum and the cycle or the season in which the real estate market is in, which we'll mention a little bit more uh, a bit later about the season. So we know the peak season for private residential was in the year 2013. It is similar to HDB. So if someone cannot tell you 2013, I think uh, or when was the last time H, uh, the private uh, or when was the last time property market was at its peak? If someone cannot tell you it's 2013, I think it's very risky because this is the year where you would know that a lot of your friends who bought in this pinnacle year is still struggling. Well, you see a lot of homeowners actually, wow, they're, they're seeing people making profits, posting online, wow, how much they make and agents posting about wow, this num large number of uh, capital gains over the last few years and all those. Those are usually in the year from 2017, 2018 onwards, right? Large gains usually from there. Those, those were around the bottom, around the bottom around here. But check back and ask those people who bought at 2013 and you can find out another totally different answer. And later we will investigate this a little bit further. But with this chart, there's a lot of stories I can tell as well. Uh, not just that you can look at the number every time we decline, it's between 15% to 25%. This is something for us to take note every time there's a decline. But every time we gain, we actually get stronger. So a, small, uh, a larger decline, a larger gain, smaller decline, a smaller gain. And right now we are at the peak of another real estate cycle. And, and why am I so confident? You could see in a cycle, uh, in a real estate cycle, it takes about four to five years. Between 2009 to 23, this is about four to five years. Between 2013 to 2017, this is also about four to five years. Between 2017 to right now, this is about four to six years, thereabouts, four to five or six years. So we're already rather delayed, possibly due to the COVID situation, which actually spurred up the prices a lot more. Uh, but we're already near a period in our real estate cycle that we know the market is priced to correct. And looking at the current external environment in, in, uh, in, in the financial sector and, and, and in equity sector and, side and everything else, uh, we know that the real estate market cycle is also slowly seeing moderation. Uh, just to prove how we know this, is generally let's look at the quarterly price movement again. Um, we see quarters of growth. Last quarter in 2022, uh, that was a time where we thought that a market should have been moderated by uh, significantly by 0 0.4. But in quarter one, suddenly there were a lot of new launches. Uh, of course, some of those are the million dollar launches in Canning Hill Pierce, for example, where somebody, some China man we all know in, a, in the news that bought more than 10 units and so on and so forth. This also started to spur up prices around that area. But there was some little impact in quarter one where some new launches came in. And right now we have started to moderate after the announcements, uh, 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 the budget announcements and with higher interest rates and things like that going on the external environment. And we saw quarter two moderating and earlier, for those of you who have joined me, uh, who was early, the early birds who came in, when I was going through some news article, you'll know that July and August, the numbers were also not so fantastic. So this quarter, we also do not expect a fantastic number, probably around 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 gain thereabouts, right? And in a year-to-year -year index, you could see a, a reasonable year, uh, real estate market should grow about 3 to 4% uh, in line with inflation. So the price movements, in the year 2021 and 2022, those were a, a little bit of a knee-jack reaction. Those were the years that start to spur up the prices here. And right now we have come to a situation, a stage where the market has moderated. We have, we have spoken about this uh, in November during the Unicorn Investment Conference. Uh, we have warned everyone to take note because this is probably the last time and the last uh, time that for homeowners who are still holding on to assets who want to uh, let go and cash out at, at the peak of the curve, this is probably the last time. And feeling it in the market itself, I can also say that the number of inquiries, especially for large quantum properties has start to reduce. And with ABSD now rise, rising to 60% for foreigners, you will also not have foreigners coming in to rescue us so quickly, to, to rescue the market so quickly. Unlikely that H, uh, the government will uh, amend the measure so soon within such a short period of time to reduce ABSD and so do, so and so, because we are also going through a period of uncertainty. I think they will let the market settle down and it's unlikely that they will remove any one of these cooling measures within such a short period of time. So we need to know the market cycle and 2023, 10 years on, uh, those people in 2013 finally can see that they have broke even their price. And later we'll go and study a little bit of those properties in this fantastic 2013 
year and see what are the progress of some of those new launches in those years, uh, whether they are right now in a good position and what are the position for those who bought in 2017 as well. There'll be a case study of something in 2017. Um, and we keep mentioning this because I wanted to elaborate a little bit more about this topic. Um, I, I find that this topic is interesting whether new launches always enjoy capital gains upon TOPs because um, there has been a lot of messages going through uh, uh, Facebook, uh, maybe Instagram, uh, TikTok these days, a lot of videos. And sometimes with so much noise out there in the market, I think as a consumer, uh, if I put myself in a position of a consumer, what I want to know is, uh, I want to know the truth. I, I want to know the authenticity of such inform the authenticity of such information. Are uh, what the the speaker or presenters in those uh, YouTube clips are what they're telling us? Is it the truth? Is it a fact? And we have to base everything on facts and figures. So, um, we want to study this because uh, a lot of them will be pushing for new launches, uh, to their consumers, promising them that upon TOP they will be able to see a capital gain. So recently I had the opportunity of working in a project at uh, RB Altitude. RB Altitude is actually a boutique, a real estate development condo around uh, River Valley. We were the a managing agent for that um, condominium and we we're distributing the unit keys for, for TOP owners. So having the experience because uh, why I want to share this is because during that period of time, we saw some homeowners who collect the keys instead of being very happy, you know, when you go TOP, you collect your keys, right? Very happy. You can cash out, you can sell, you can make a profit. Unfortunately for all these homeowners who bought uh, RV Altitude, most of them have not even, uh, cannot even sell at a launch price. So most of them lost money and they were first encouraged to buy because they were promised certain rental yield, they were pr promised certain capital gains, they were promised so much, much, much by the salesperson, but end up when they collect their keys, these were not fulfilled. And there were statistics that have shown that, you know, that time when they bought, it was a little bit risky at the price that they entered in, uh, which is why uh, they, they might have to reconsider back then, but then they make the decision, they move forward and today they may be, probably some of them may be regretting like for those who are staying for, for, for their own consumption, for own stay, then maybe it won't impact them so much because another 10 years down the line, we do expect most of our properties to also increase in value uh, due to the scarcity of land in Singapore. But this myth, or this is, is this a myth or is this a fact? Do most new launches enjoy capital gains? Let us study a little bit further. Um, I've also been using this chart very frequently. Uh, this chart actually talks about the prices of new launches and the prices uh, for resale. Um, what I wanted to show is really the disparity in prices between a, a resale and a new launch right now, because there's a huge difference and a huge gap. And this gap is forming bigger and bigger and bigger. Developers, as they bought their land uh, through government land sales, have priced their property higher and higher and higher. Consumers are continuing to buy from them. But what we need to take note is that when we start to collect our keys upon TOP, we are unlike a developer and we cannot demand that our buyer come in and buy at our price. We, are, we don't set it like a developer. If I today own uh, bought a, a, a unit from a, from a developer, a new launch, and today I want to resell it to the marketplace, a buyer comes in and view my unit, I can't possibly tell the buyer that, look, the developer sold to me at $2,000 per square foot. Today it's only fair for me to charge you $2,200 per square foot. The buyer is not going to buy that. All right. They will look at what's the market comparables, what's the market situation right now, and pay you a reasonable market price. And it could be maybe $1,800 or $1,900 per square foot at that moment. So this price or the red line that you see right now over here does not necessarily mean that your property that you buy from the developer will rise 98%, whereas you buy a resale, rise 25%. No, it tells us a different story. It tells us that developer is setting their price higher and higher and higher, whereas the resale market is moderating in its growth. Of course, together they combine and that's what causes the price index to jump up and skew up over the years because the number of new launches that came up significantly every quarter actually helps to pull up the price indexes, all right, the general price indices. So for people who are aware of all this information, then they really know the true health of the real estate market. Um, I was uh, running through this 
article which I thought I wanted to share with all of you. Uh, this was something I got on, uh, I think it was on Facebook and I uh, just wanted to study it in more detail. So just to read out the case study for everyone to hear. This says one of his clients, a uh, 26 year old, made an incredible 83% return in just three years from her first resale condo. Um, so when, when the client approached, she has only 150 grand in uh, savings in the bank, no idea where to invest in, did a bit of research and they found a great one bedroom at Kingsford Water Bay at 585,000. Uh, this means 146,000 cash down payment. Uh, she managed to rent it out for $2,000 per month. And after three years, she sold it at 680,000, taking back a cash proceeds of 268,000, 83% ROI. Okay. Very simple article. Um, I was curious because I find that there were a lot of dubious uh, information here. Uh, and I went on to research further and, and went on to find. First and foremost, we could not find this property that was bought at 585. We could find properties that were sold at 680,000, but we could not find anything that was bought at 585. And later we'll share with you a case study on Kingsford Water Bay of somebody who bought a one bedroom unit and we'll do a case study on that. But definitely we can't find this property anywhere. All right. Um, and also let's let's take a look. This person bought resale unit at Kingsford Water Bay. So it means that upon TOP, she buys it at 585 straight away and sold it at 680. Um, we find it very interesting because uh, that also did not include any cost involved, transaction cost in it. And then straight away, you take a ballpark figure and you say that's 83% ROI. For most people, that would be as, as good as telling you, uh, if you bought your HDB at 500,000 and you sold it at 600,000, you have $100,000 in terms of your capital gains. And congratulations, that is almost like 20% uh, ROI. It's as good as telling us something like that. So why I'm mentioning this, because I want to investigate further uh, whether there is some truth. And this is what we found out. Okay, first and foremost, where is Kingsford Water Bay? Uh, just for all of you who doesn't know this place, it's very near to Paileba Airport. It's near to Aogang Station, just a short walk there, very close to Sungai Ser Serangoon. Uh, and this is a very linear and longish uh, development. At one time, uh, the developer Kingsford also underwent a lot of uh, uh, complaints with regards to their defects in their building. And in, it was intercepted even by BCA at one time to issue the TOP permit. And because of that, it also delayed some of the other projects like Normanton Park uh, because of developers not fulfilling certain uh, criteria in their building structure. So we found a property 0654, similar to what the, uh, the earlier case was. Uh, and this is a case of somebody who bought it at 521, not 580, but 521,000, sold it at 680,000. So I went to find those properties that were sold at this price and we try and study this article. Okay, we assume that this person, in this case, uh, we assume that this person has a holding period of seven years. Why you need four years from construction and three years, then he ran out for the next three years at $2,000 per month. Okay, I'm assuming a very low interest rate because back then interest rate was only about 1.5%. So these are some assumptions we make. And also based on the assumption, the buyer actually put in only the uh, max um, the minimum so the minimum cash down payment that we, they required at that time was about 25% and then 75% was on loan so these are some of the facts that we are going to look at and here are our findings okay sale price 521 680,000 um, we need to less off quite a few things we need to less off stamp fees your buyer stamp duty. In this case, we assume the buyer has no additional buyer stamp duty. The interest cost and how we develop it is that there's progressive payment. Don't forget there's progressive payment during this launch period. So the progressive payment for the four years plus the next three years, we accumulate the whole interest. It's not the monthly installment, huh? but the interest cost. In other words, in your when you take up a loan, usually you pay off the principal and your interest at the same time. So we only calculate the interest. So when we do this, we are putting ourselves in the shoe of a, a business owner. Generally, how much I put in, uh, how much I put in versus how much I take out, I want to see a positive figure. So this looking at the cost perspective, the legal cost, the agent fees, not in the purchase because they bought it from developer, but in the sale of the property at 680000 at 2%. Maintenance fees and sinking fund. So we calculate the approximate maintenance fee and sinking fund you will likely incur over the next 
three years only, not seven years, because four years was under construction, so three years, well, they are uh, getting some uh, rental income. Um, maybe because this was rental, so they didn't really need to pay so much into the initial renovation and set up. So I don't need to install the lights, the curtains, maybe add in a few uh, fixtures and so and so forth or furniture and so forth. Keep it within 10,000 or perhaps lower. Property tax. So when you actually rent out your property for the next for the three years, you also need to pay property tax at a higher higher rate of more than ten percent. So that property tax figure we also accumulate in, and also you add in their rental income which they receive. Okay. So we want to speak the truth because uh, sometimes when we look at this figure uh, through our previous uh, webinar, sometimes we may get a little bit, we tend to be a little bit pessimistic. But in this case, what is the truth is that this owner actually enjoyed a capital gains of 14.5 because it was an investment property. And as I mentioned here, something that's very important is the break-even price because of the rent, because of the rental income that he received. Generally, if he have sold something above $535,000 today, he would have broke even. Anything above $533,942, it will be a profit. So right here, uh, this is where we are very efficient in finding out this thing called break-even price. Because a lot of us, when we sell our property, for example, we own a HDB at $500,000 and we sell it at $600,000, we would think that our break-even, we would have made a profit of $100,000. But that is not a fact. We, gotta, we, we really need to squeeze out all the juice out of it. What are the costs here, costs here, costs here, costs here, costs here. I spend so much on this property. At the end, we know what is the price that we break even. So this is how we calculate break even price. But congratulations to this owner. He has an annualized gains of 14.5%. So this is a very good investment generally for this property owner at Kingsford Water Bay. Guess again, when did this owner bought this unit? Seven years. So if you look back seven years later, uh, seven years earlier, it's actually in the year 2016, 2017. So around that. Again, they actually entered the market when the market was near its bottom. Was near its bottom. All right. Let's look at it from a different perspective. What if you were staying in this unit instead of actually selling this unit, renting it out, uh, collecting rental income? Now you have no rental income. But actually, I'm staying in this unit. I'm actually consuming it. What is the cost? And what is my break even cost, break even price rather. How much must I sell above in order to see that I really truly gain a profit? So this is something that we work out here at Pegasus. Uh, so let's take a look again. Stamp fees, the same, the interest rate, the same. Agent's fees a little bit different because you don't need to pay the agent fees for the rental of the property. Maintenance again fund is the same. Setup cost might be a bit higher because now you've got to, oh, I got to fit in a, Maybe I got to build in a, 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 a built-in wardrobe. I need to build in a, a, a bed. I need to buy certain furniture. I need to set up. I need to put in a lot more fixtures into my house. So the setup cost usually for home state is slightly higher. Perhaps I don't like the design of the kitchen. I want to take away these walls so and so forth. So we assume the setup cost is higher. You can actually, uh, and then of course, property tax is lower because this is owner occupied. There is no more rental income in this. So what is the break-even price? So Guess how much this owner needs in order to see a profit. Needs to sell the price they need to sell in order to see a profit. Oops. I think I got it wrong. 611, by the way. <laughs> Just a typo error. 611,942 to be exact. Okay, not 61,000. 611,942. And the analyzed game was 3.7%. So this is, should be 611. Nine four two. So in general, this owner needs to sell around six hundred and eleven thousand nine hundred and forty two dollars before they can actually consider everything else in excess of profit. This is from an owner occupier perspective, but it's still good because this property has actually still managed to uh, at least keep in line with inflation over the years, and it's still growing. So there's some savings element when they bought this property. But if I sold it at 550000 I didn't make 30000 That's the message we want to drive across all right, to everyone. So this is a good example of something that happened around for an owner that bought around 2016, 2017, where the market was near its bottom. What about this? This is the time period 
And I keep mentioning this thing, 2013, when the market was at its peak. What about these homeowners right now? They also bought a new launch. Does it always mean that the new launch will always be profitable? They bought a new launch in the year 2013. They came in when the season was in the summer, where the market was at its hottest, when it was very warm and bullish. It's a season called summer. What happened to them? Marina One Residences, as some of us are familiar, entry price 2255, 2308 right now, 0.2% annualized gain over a 10 years period. So you held on for 10 years. Fortunately, today you see gross annualized gains. And I'm only talking in terms of price. I haven't even calculated the break even price. Remember, we have cost of holding if you take an interest. Remember, there's maintenance fee and sinking fund. Remember, there's property tax. Remember, there's legal fees, there's also agent fees all involved. So just looking at it from the price perspective, the average price, it is a gain. In effect, we know it's likely that they have not break even, even until today. And this I could say for this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten properties. And those that are bought in 2013. Can easily ask any property owners that have entered the market around 2013 until today. And you will find the answer truthfully from them, whether they have actually enjoyed any capital gains from them until today. This is just an overview of the whole condominium. And we are showing you some real data that proves that not every new launch, which you bought at the new launch, even upon TOP, not, not saying TOP, but we give them a 10 years holding period. Today, fortunately, if they bought it at 2225, or rather like Marina one, if today I bought it, if 10 years ago, I bought it at 2255, fortunately, today I see 2308. Thankfully, I see that the price has appreciated already. But that was over 10 years, and that did not include my interest cost and all my costs over 10 years. So this is how significant the impact it is if you came in at the wrong season. So what are the seasons? We have spring, summer, autumn, and winter. The hottest period is summer. So we know that temperature is at the warmest. The coldest period is winter. And we know that temperature is lowest and the prices are lowest. And right now, we believe strongly here that we are entering autumn. We are moderating. The prices are moderating. For those people, bargain hunters that think that, wow, that means today after your webinar, I can go out and get a cheap deal, great deal or something like that. No, we are not in winter season yet. We only entered autumn. Autumn prices moderate. Things correct slowly. We may not really go into winter because of all the cooling measures and the prudency of the policies that the government have implemented. We may not enter a situation like China right now in their real estate market where prices have corrected 20 to 30%. And we have seen in our previous uh, property cycle that even in the worst case scenario 10 years ago, uh, property market at the worst correct 25%. And then the last uh, the last peak at between 2013 to 2017, the last correction was only about 15%. So I've seen that we may enter kind of winter, but it's just chilly, a little bit chilly, but not really that cold. So this is how, because of policies that's been drawn out from our government to pre prevent a calamity and avalanche where you see, wow, suddenly all the snow, when we go in the heaviest, uh, snow in, 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 in maybe decades. So this is not going to happen in Singapore. And autumn may be there and autumn may be here for a significant period of time. But autumn is healthy. Look at the beautiful trees. <laughs> autumn is a, health, uh, it's, it's, it's a very, very healthy time of a real estate season. So entering into autumn and winter, what are the best strategies we can adopt investing in real estate during this period of time. During autumn and winter, if you follow this strategy, I think most people, um, if you follow this strategy, you will, you will actually gain a lot more than those people who rush following a herd instinct uh, around summer, uh, during the summer season, which was last year, and rushed in to buy uh, a real estate last year, for example, uh, generally, uh, they, they will probably feel a lot more because uh, that is the same example of people who bought in 2013, right? So right now, in our season of autumn, we are seeing that it's a good period for people who are considering upsizing. See, for example, 
you own a HDB in Jurong. Maybe now you want to consider upsizing to a location nearer to the CBD in the prime area. As we mentioned, these are the area which do not fall under the, uh, the future scheme of the standard plus and prime. These are the location which people can actually take a look because there's going to be a lot of demand in the future uh, due to a change of government policies. So what we meant is because you sell low, you buy, uh, you sell low, you buy low, you sell high, you buy high. And right now in autumn, when you sell lower, you have smaller cash proceeds. So for example, perhaps in the summer season, your property could be sold at 500,000. But in the autumn, you could only sell it at 480,000. So you lost maybe 20,000 here. But you bought something at 1 million. Perhaps in the autumn, in the, in the summer season, that property can be sold at 1 million. But because today, it is an autumn season, you buy at 950,000. So while you lost 20,000 in the sale, but you actually gain 50,000 in the purchase. So that's what we mean by actually moving forward. Uh, there is an opportunity for people to upsize because while your lower cash assets, you lose it, you, you did not get the best outcome out of it. But however, if you're thinking of upsizing, your bigger asset actually costs lower. So your loan amount is lower, your cost is much lower. So for people who are thinking of upsizing, now I'm moving from HDB to a better location or from HDB to a condominium or from a condominium to a landed property. I think this is a period, beginning of a period. Don't get me wrong, not asking you to rush into the market right now. It's the beginning of a period for buyers where they can start to have more opportunities or to relook really into their financial plans, relook really into your goals and your aspiration, what you want, when you're, well, of course, everything must be in line with eventually in line with your financial plans, when you want to FI and because of that, do I get an opportunity now to possibly look at an upsizing from a smaller to a bigger flat or something like that. And in an autumn and winter period, we can also look out for more bargain deals, a more developer discounts or attractive sales packages, which we're also beginning to find out more in the marketplace right now. They are beginning to see some very good discounts like I saw in one Pearl Bank, uh, some advisor was sharing with me another day earlier that there's about 5 to 15% discount going at some of these uh, condominiums. Uh, some developers will start to reintroduce deferred payment scheme in future. They will start to give up furniture vouchers and so on and so forth. So these are things that you can look out for during the autumn and winter season. We are only in the beginning of this. We are still very close to the peak. So for investors, you might still want to wait a little longer, perhaps another six months or one year. For homeowners, I think if you're really genuinely because you need to find a place because you're getting married soon or you have some aspiration for your family because next year they need to register for their schools, for their primary one education, they need to be moving to a certain location. I think this is still a good period for you to move over. Uh, we have already uh, explained a little bit earlier uh, for homeowners, generally the investment outcome is definitely much lower than for those who bought a second property. We will believe that for homeowners, you should focus more on the attributes for your lifestyle, for your family, what do they need, what do they require, do they want to upgrade, do they prefer a better lifestyle, so and so forth, rather than look at the end state, which is the ROI from, from investment perspective. Okay, just give me a minute. And what are the best strategies for spring and summer? We covered for autumn and winter. So when market was really hot, which was about uh, last year, six months ago, when market was so hot, we feel that there was an opportunity which maybe some of us may have missed it. For those with a bigger asset, to right size it to a smaller property. So the keyword is right sizing. So let's, for example, I have a $3 million asset which I can sell at a peak. So I sold that $3 million property and I went to buy a $1.5 million condominium. So I cash out $1.5 million, for example. And with this $1.5 million, I reallocate it into equities. And then I do call it dollar cost averaging along the way. And I will see another growth in the next five years. And then I re-enter the market there again. And I could see more cash proceeds uh, later on. I mean, coming in when the markets, when the real estate market start to make its uh, small correction. So these are the best strategies, which is better to right size when the market is at its peak. So knowing what are the things to do during the season, I think is very important. And most of you will have a financial consultant together with you. I think that's when they can give you the right advice about what are the seasons that you should come in to look at real estate. What are seasons based on the based on not just the real estate market, but on your own personal financial plans. So we need to be ready now. And I think that a lot of us 
uh, are in the equities market today and we are all waiting for that opportunity. We are all waiting for maybe something a little bit more wind chilly, a, a bit more wintery before we, we enter. So there might be opportunities that might be come up in a few years from now. But if you are impatient and if you really want to invest, here are something for us to share because these are some information that we have, uh, which I'm going to share with you about some opportunities that you can consider right now or maybe in a few months to come, right? In a few months to come. So we saw the, within the real estate market, there are three segments. There is the call central region, which is the CBD area, Orchard, Tangling, now Marina Bay as well, and some parts of Sentosa. We also see the RCR, rest of central area, which is just right outside the city fringes, areas like McPherson, areas like Topayo, uh, areas like Kalang, uh, maybe even up to Arjunit. And outside OCR places further up north, uh, maybe in Woodlands, Surong, and in Tampanese, these are the OCR area. And the OCR area, which is outside central region, and the RCR area, which comprises a lot of our heartlanders, a lot of our Singaporeans, where we mostly stay in. This is the area that grew the most. And you note the blue line, the core central region, they are actually lagging behind by quite a distance. So the prime properties have not accelerated over the last 10 years or more, more, more than a decade since 2009, even after the Lehman crisis recovery. They have not actually accelerated that much, probably on a stagnated line. So I see the gap getting bigger and bigger, and I see an opportunity actually in the core central region where prices of properties around 2,500 today does not seem too expensive as you compare to prices in RCR and OCR region, which have just crossed 2,000. So there are opportunities for within the core central region that one can explore. I'm going to share with you a lot more later on. Um, this is the data in perspective of a table uh, between CCR, OCR, and RCR. Again, just to show you that CCR, prime area in Singapore, condos area in there, has been catching up slowly, but not really in a significant pace compared to the OCR and RCR region over the past few quarters. So it's still lagging behind. And one of the reasons uh, that the change in the tide is because there are now fewer uh, fewer HDB owners, HDB upgraders chasing the condo dream, as, as we see in this whole article. Uh, interest rate has gone up. So the dream or the momentum in the RCR and the OCR area has started to slow down. Uh, real estate market has also started to moderate. And there is some price correction going on in most of the places. So with fewer HDB upgraders, it would also mean that it's likely that OCR and RCR prices may also correct itself moderately over the next few quarters. So these HDB upgraders, mostly their purchasing power goes to the OCR and RCR area. So you'll see less momentum and less price increase in this area. And one of the key things that we noted is that a lot of times when developers uh, sell a new launch or when salesperson at new launch pro uh, project, when they sell to you, they will always sell to you the develop the, the, the cost and they will always explain to you why the price will never be below a certain price. So let's say for example the developer bought the developer bought a government land at $1,100 per square foot and they are selling it to you at $2,000 per square foot. That difference of 900 is basically the construction cost, marketing cost, and so forth. And they will be able to justify to you why they cannot sell to you below $2,000 per square foot because selling to you anything below that will be a loss to the developer. Surprisingly, most consumers, they bought that story. So, and they'll explain to you that the land cost has been always going higher and higher and higher. That is impossible at one stage. I even hear some salespeople telling us it's almost virtually impossible that land costs will ever get cheaper. It will never come down. The price of state land will never come down. That was a statement that I hear many years ago. And this was allow a lot of HDB upgraders to chase the dream. So people are more confident to go and buy a new launch project in the OCR and RCR area, feeling that they will definitely make money when they TOP. Again, we have shown you some examples, critical examples of those who bought in 2013 that didn't have that dream fulfilled. But of course, there are some people who bought in 2017, like the person at Kingsford Water Bay, that investor there that has their dream fulfilled. But there will also be a significant number of people who didn't have the dreams fulfilled before, because simply because they entered the market at the wrong season. At the wrong season, as simple as that. Over time, yes, 
Over time, Singapore real estate prices will appreciate in value. But you can ask any Marina One residences owner, it's been 10 years. So they bought it for almost 10 years. Over a 10 years period, yes, the price have a, a set, a, a appreciated, but have they break even? And going forward, how much more costs are they going to incur? If we are one of those homeowners right now, what is the kind of feeling we would have today if we are one of those homeowners there? What kind of uh, psychology will we have today? Because we'll be in that state of mind that we'll be feeling, oh, as, yeah, the price have gone up, it should go higher. But every time they think about that, their cost also went higher. The interest cost, they're going to feel, they pay more and more and more. Their maintenance fee starts to go up. Tax rate starts to go up. Inflation starts to go up. And and everything starts to go up, but they're still hoping for capital appreciation. And they are refused to let go of their property and say, no, I refuse to cut loss. I don't want to cut loss because it's very painful. But they continue to bleed even more. That's a psychology that homeowners may get themselves into if they come in the wrong season. So there were more uh, land sales and it's getting more cautious right now for developers, especially for some of the latest land tenders around the land tour area, woodlands area. Uh, in a good time, in a good period of time, usually you have at least 10 developers bidding for a single piece of land. And recent land sales, we have seen only one or two bidders in most of the land sales, except for some very prime locations. Usually it's only one or two bidders. In this case, the one in Lentor only also only just have about two bidders. The one in Woodlands have six. Okay, I wanted to study this uh, piece of land in Lentor area with all of you. In order to share with you that myth that the, the land GLS or government land sale prices will never get lower. So let's study Lentor. Lentor, because a lot of people bought some of the projects recently, Lentor Modern, Lentor Hills Residences, uh, as you can see in this map. Lentor is a new location, by the way, near Yuchu Kang. So uh, it's an area um, over there that's currently undergoing some developments around the Yuchu Kang area. So this location, I wanted to study it because there's a lot of land parcels that were sold recently. Uh, for some reasons, suddenly the government start to focus on this location and release a lot of land parcels here. So the first land parcels, which actually right now known as uh, Lentor Modern, was sold at $1,933. This is the break-even price, by the way. Break-even price for the developer. Developer will not sell to you at $1,933. They will have to sell to you at $2,001, $2,200 per square foot. So this is the price that was sold for Lentor Modern. Average about $2,200 per square foot. This was in July 2021. Then came Lentor Hills Residences, which actually was slightly lower in 2022. Um, but mainly because Lentor Modern is a mixed development with more below and, you know, there's a premium because you have the more below and you pay about $100 more just to be $100 per square foot more just to make sure that below you have shopping center and below you have facility, I mean, all the shops, the eateries and everything. So this also because it's closer to the station, so it's slightly higher. Lentor Hills Residence was just, Lentor Hills Residences, slightly lower. The break-even price for the developer is 1820 PSF. Um, this next one was 1993. It's not launched yet. The next one here called Hillock Green, which I think you'll hear very soon uh, in the media. Uh, uh, in social media platform, a lot of agents will start to promote Hillock Green. Hillock Green was bought at 1963 PSF. In fact, this was the highest price transacted within the whole Lentor area. So if you were to ask me based on price alone, uh, unless you like really love the layout and you really love the, the, the layout or the features, I think this is one project that you might want to not consider. Right? <laughs> just just not consider based on the and based on the break-even price from the developer. I think this developer at this moment right now would be at the uh, in the most precarious situation to price it correctly so that they don't turn off the buyers. But at the same time, I'm, I'm quite curious how much more sales they can get for Hillock Green. And their recent land sales in 2023. Let's take a look. Right now, the recent government land sales in 2023 has gotten even below 1820 to 1797 and 1793. So these two plots of land, for those who are actually thinking of buying in the north area around Yuchukang, maybe with a little bit more patience. They're not going to be launched so soon. Uh, this is April 2023, the tender closing, and this is in September. So you expect something around June, July next year before the developers 
we'll start to launch new projects over there. It's something for you to consider. And comparing it with, with neighboring projects, I think with a hundred dollars price difference, this is something for those people who stay in the north that they can look at. Uh, what is not being uh, shown here is there's another land sales in Topayo that's right now out for tender, uh, somewhere very close to Bradle Station in Lorong 1, Topayo. And uh, that's also something for us to take note as well, uh, whether we will want to, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, focus on that piece of uh, property when it was launched later. We are quite curious to find out what's the, in fact, what's the future, uh, the land, land bidding price that will happen uh, in, in the next few months. <clears throat> All right, that's just one piece for those people who stay in the north. Let's take a look now more to the east or maybe closer to the central, closer to my office here at Geelong in Harrison. So this is Jalan Tembusu. Tembusu is very close to uh, this location. It's quite near to Katong area, Hague Road, just a little bit further away from Hague Road, very near to I-12 Katong, very near to Katong Shopping Center. Closest MRT will be the Marine Parade Station. All right. So again, there's only two bidders for this uh, Jalan Tempuzu private land. And why I want to mention this is as an opportunity as well for those who are looking for new projects in the coming months, in the coming months. So let's go through some of the new, the, the break-even prices for some of those pri uh, projects here in the East as well. First, we have the Continuum. This is an on-block project. It's a freehold. Uh, it's selling at two, it's a break-even price for developer was 2296 PSF. And that is why it's selling at $2,500 on the average uh, right now, $2,500. Uh, the break-even developer is 2296 so generally they will sell it at $2,500. The next piece of land was uh, Tembusu Grand. So Tembusu Grand was launched later on. It was uh, launched at a price of 2130 PSF. Or rather, the break-even price was 2130 PSF. The, the selling price is also about $2,400 to $2,500 per square foot. This is just beside it caught. Uh, as you can see, there's two stations in between. One is Dakota on the left. The other station that's close by is the Marine Parade Station on the right. Then we know something closer to home, which is uh, Grand Dunman, somewhere closer to my office right now, very close to Dakota Station. Uh, this piece of land is a 99-year leasehold land. The break-even price for the developer is 2292 PSF, very close to the continuum, which is freehold. So for some people, they might think that, hey, because of that, I go and get a uh, continuum freehold that may be a better option. Yes, perhaps you might want to look at the uh, amenities as well. You might, have, might not like to compare other, other, other features, but certainly if you look at it from a freehold and leasehold perspective, it seems like continuum is a better prospect uh, because it's freehold, uh, whereas Grand Dunman over here, a uh, Grand Dunman over here, this is leasehold and then this is freehold. But before you start to put your dollars in, before you start to plunge in and place your money in, let's take a look at something that was land, uh, the previous newspaper article of the land that was sold. And let's find out what is the break-even price for the new land sales this year, 2023, government land sales in 2023 along Jalan Tembusu. This is the piece of land around here. 1911 PSF. So I think today we have broken the myth that... Um, GLS, government land sales, and government land sales prices can never get lower. Uh, just in August, last month, in fact, after National Day, uh, Simlian tendered for this piece of land and they won it at, and calculating their construction costs and break-even prices around 1911 PSF. You're looking for them to maybe launch at $2,200 per square foot, at most maybe 2003 But certainly much with a $200 price difference, it's 99 years, no doubt, the opposite land, which is Tembusu Grand, is also 99 years and it's just opposite. Looking at the price, I think I'm waiting for those who are looking for something in the east who wants to buy a new project around this area. I think you might want to stand by a little bit and, and, and monitor the sale price for this, this piece of land at Jalan Tembusu. We, we do not know the name of this project yet, but it should be announced since it was bought only in August. It should be announced around July, June, July again, or, or middle of next year. It's something for you to really look at everyone. So if you're considering something closer to the office, you want to look at some pieces of property, I think this is something that you might want to look into. Just by within the same road, you have a $200 per square foot price difference. If you're buying something of $1,000, of 1,000 square feet, that's about a two or three bedroom size unit, 1,000 square feet, you're already saving $200,000 against the neighbor across. 
So I think with that buffer, it creates a, a, a much more opportunity for an upside in the future, especially since both are also quite new property. In fact, your one will be newer than the one opposite. Yeah. Recent land sales uh, or recent new launches has also seen very slow uh, results. Um, the the miss didn't see a very good positive. There was only about 20 over percent. But the one that really surprised me was the TML Maxwell, which was in the CBD area. It's, it's probably because of this. Uh, I mean, generally, it's because of this sale price uh, above 3000 But it's, it's still a very brilliant location around Tanjong Baga, just opposite Maxwell Hawker Center. Uh, so it's so only seven out of, uh, I think that's less than 5% of the units were sold on launch day. So it's something that is going to be very challenging for the developer to price it or reprice it or repackage it. So there are some opportunities coming up, I think, coming uh, going forward uh, in some of the new projects as well for us to take note of. Um, if you need further advice, you can always consult one of our, you can always consult me or one of our Pegasus uh, consultants. Uh, we can provide you with a lot more information about some of these new launches or where, where can we find some of these good news coming up. And if you are interested in those uh, Tembusu or, or Lentor projects or things like that, maybe later in the feedback form, you can just let us know. We'll keep you informed once the projects are launched. Uh, we are also very curious to find out a little bit more about the launch price for such uh, projects and, and where the developer's position is. So those are the projects that you might just give us a thinker in a feedback form. Let us know. We'll follow up with you once we have further information on the news, uh, on the launches as, as, as we get go forward. These are projects that are not launched right now. They are really slated for next year. Um, we also, for myself, I also have been quite active overseas in some overseas opportunities because sometimes our clients may want to look at having already bought two properties in Singapore or maybe if they have a HDB and they have no other opportunities to enter the residential market and they may not be so confident with the commercial or industrial market or maybe not so familiar, um, they might want to explore opportunities overseas. Myself, I have a bit of experience in KL. I was there since 2015, working on a lot of projects in Kuala Lumpur. So I'm more familiar with Malaysia. Although sometimes I do have comp compatriots who are working on Japanese, the Japanese markets as well as the Cambodian markets. But looking across the causeway, I think it's much easier because uh, while um, we are, have always been looking at good opportunities that we can have closer to home, such that we can call it a second home or, or something that we can travel back to Singapore much easier, Unfortunately, the HSR project, the high-speed rail, which was terminated, was a major project uh, during the past uh, government that actually terminated this project. The previous government, in fact, uh, under Dr. Mahathir, when he terminated, it was a really uh, uh, moving backwards, more maybe by five to 10 years, because had it been materialized, I think probably today we will be, I could be in KL holding this Zoom webinar, have, having my lunch later on, and then coming back later in the afternoon within half one and a half hours taking on the high-speed rail. But such dream, may, we may have to wait much longer. But something we don't have to wait much longer is, of course, the RTS, the MRT linking from Woodlands North Station to Bukit Chaga Station. And that is what is causing this issue here in the Johor market. Uh, right now, Johor Baru developments are quite in high demand. There are quite a few large projects there. But for those who are thinking of moving and, and thinking of Johor per se, I would think the safest is to be very close to the Bukit Chaga MRT station, which means it has to be very, very close to the CIQ. Um, you have to target people uh, or Malaysian workers working in Singapore generally look, living in a small unit or tourists per se. And if you're moving further than that into Danga Bay or Forest City or Medini or areas like that, I think with that, you the traveling distance is a bit far. Amenities is still not up yet. And a lot of us have been given some promises that have not been fulfilled. However, in Johor Bahru, which is still traditionally Zone A, which is still traditionally the main area, we have seen a lot of developments and a lot of improvements, a lot of changes to the cityscape, to the infrastructure in these locations. Coronation Plaza is coming up just opposite City Square. Uh, new CBDs are arriving up, but it really has to be that close to the Bukit Chaga station. As I stress again, before I would encourage any Singaporeans to even think about investing in Johor Bahru. Anything that is further than that, maybe more than a kilometer, or if you need, really need to drive before you can get to that location, I think you need to think again. Because uh, just imagine for the number of properties like in RNF Princess Cove, the people that can rent there, you can easily walk to the MRT station in Bukit Chaga, travel to Singapore to work. 
without even having to drive, without even need, needing public transport, and how much they can save on that. So I think uh, traditionally, you really want to be safe. You have to be very close to the MRT station in Bukit Chaga, Johor Bahru. So we studied one of the projects, which is also um, uh, uh, from one of the developments, which is very close to the station, which is called Keysight JVCC. Uh, and we wanted to know a little bit more about this project. So I went over, I think it was about two weeks ago, to find out a little bit more information about this. Um, it's going to be iconic because it's near the cafes where you, uh, it's near the coast and somewhere where you have cafes, just a short walk down from, from City Square, which is, which, is, which is actually around here, City Square. And the customs are around here. The station is right there above, as you can see. So just to mention briefly, we thought that this was something that is interesting because it's the entry price is not high as I will, I'm going to display to you later on. And it's somewhere where you have a lot of interest among Singaporean buyers right now. And more importantly, we are more confident is because this project is actually a, hot, a hotel service department and it's actually managed by Oakwood, which is a subsidiary of Escort, the Escort Group Singapore. And we all know that Escort is actually owned by Capital Land. So... There is a lot of uh, management and strong management here. And in fact, our rental will be managed by Oakwood, Oakwood, O-A-K-W-O-O-D, as I'm going to show in my next slides here. So this is a partnership with Oakwood, a member of Escort Group, um, providing us a guaranteed rental returns of six years for 5%. So generally, that's about 30% off. So if I come in with uh, uh, a property at around 600,000, already I have 30% off this 600,000. I'm paying about 400 over 1,000. So there's a profit sharing of, uh, there's a guaranteed rental for five years, profit sharing of around six to seven percent for the next 15 years. The down payment for most investors is around sixty thousand dollars. We're not going to mention anything much more about these projects, but for those interested to find out more later on, you can also uh, just uh, drop us a line in a feedback form. Um, the price for such project is probably around seven hundred thousand dollars ringgit thereabouts. Okay. Coming to the last part of my webinar today, I'm going to talk about some recent hypes uh, that we hear. And what are these recent hypes? Generally, these are things that we hear like co-living, co-working, and storage hubs. So these are some of the hypes that are going around uh, social media as well, where people talk about co-living space, co-working space, so on and so forth. Uh, I just want to talk about the regulations because it has gone a bit overboard in my opinion, and people are thinking, wow, everything I can partition here, partition there, I can get more rental income, I can do this, I can do that, I can... From a perspective, from a MCST perspective, or MA, run, a person running MA, I know what are the regulations or building regulations behind such developments, and I know the risk. I'm not saying that it's entirely a no-no, but you need to structure your co-living space into something that is livable. There are some conditions. So what are the conditions? Let's take a look. Firstly, occupancy cap. You know that we are all uh, subjected to the occupancy cap of six unrelated sales, uh, six unrelated persons per property. In other words, if I'm renting out my whole unit, I cannot have more than six people at any one time. And they must be, if, if it's related, okay, your helper can be part of the family. I mean, if it's a family, your helper can be part of it. But generally, if they are unrelated, if they are friends or people, strangers, they are staying, if you are doing co-living, you can only have a maximum up to six unrelated salespersons. Next, we're going to talk about partitioning. If you carry out, okay, we're going to read out because this is a regulation I copied from URA website and I'm just going to read out to you exactly. If you plan to carry out any internal partitioning works on your property, you must ensure that it does not compromise the nature of a property as a, self, a single self-sufficient residential unit with essential features such as a living, dining and a kitchen. So if you're going to take the living dining and you're going to make it into a bedroom, you already infringe this regulation. For residential unit, internal part repartitioning can be exempted from planning permission. So you need to apply for planning permission from URA, only provided that the repartitioning does not alter the original unit, the nature of the original unit to function, again, as a single self-sufficient residential unit with essential amenities. Any proposed internal partitioning unit which result in the creation of new subunits within the original residential dwellings are not exempted from planning position. In other words, actually, if you want to do your co-living layout and everything, rightfully, you are supposed to get permission from URA, which is most likely going to be rejected. 
unless you have a very good strong reason and unless it's more for own stay. Um, where we saw a lot of co-living expertise out there sharing with you all the co-living uh, stories and how they make money by co-living and so on and so forth. It is not as realistic as it seems. There are It carries certain level of risk. So if you are one of the homeowners that is thinking of this scheme, uh, I wish to warn you, maybe you want to be aware of this risk and if something happens, uh, you must be ready to take the risk because there, there are opportunities that uh, we, we don't know. It has not happened. You could be fine. In some cases, in most cases, like people run BNB, they were fine and have fines even up to a million dollars. We have, we, have, we have heard stories like that. So these are just some things for people who are thinking of. This is the regulation. You can log into URA website to find out a little bit more. I just extracted it entirely from there just to let us know what is co-living all about. With that, thank you very much. Uh, it's almost 12 o'clock and I've covered most of the topic. So thank you very much. But uh, before you go, um, uh, or rather if you have any questions or so and so forth, I uh, would really appreciate if you can share some of these questions uh, or rather you can send some of these questions in a feedback form. Maybe if you can write us a feedback. I'm going to put this uh, link in the chat group. Just give me a moment. I'm going to stop share. Let me put up the link in the chat group so that all of you can go in and uh, uh, just do a quick feedback for us. Hopefully, we, what I shared today is uh, useful to all of you because uh, it's been quite a long session today. So I'm hoping so. I just posted the, the link in the chat group so you can actually go on. Yeah, so. All right. You can unmute yourself if you want to ask questions off, off air. Uh, let me just stop the recording as well.